Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. And now, here are Bob and Richard. Good afternoon. Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. I'm Bob Dancer. And I'm Richard Munchkin. Our guest today is a surveillance guy. He does not work in Las Vegas and would rather not tell you where he does work, but he um, seems to know what he's talking about. So we have asked a lot of our listeners' questions, and let's see where they go. And, and before we get uh, Bob, before we get into um, the listener questions, um, can I ask how long have you been in surveillance? I've been doing this for over a decade. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Bob. And, okay. What's the value to coloring up your chips and leaving the blackjack table occasionally during high counts? Would that throw off? a surveillance guy thing, and this guy clearly no squat if he's, uh, the player clearly no squat if uh, he's doing such a thing, or would that be totally ignored and the player is just losing EV? No, I could see, I could totally see that working, um, as long as you're willing to give up your EV. I mean, um, depending on how, how the count, you know, how high the count is at the time, it would definitely throw us off if it's, you know, getting be plus 12, plus 15, and you walk, you know, there might be, some doubt thrown in our mind there, um, but who's to say we won't be following you to wherever you go? <laughs> so there's a, there's always a chance that you know there that would throw somebody off the scent, um, you know, especially if it's a busy night, you know, maybe Friday, Saturday night where things are going off and the place is rocking, and you know you have a chance to uh, to blend in to another to another area or come back to that same game. But yeah, that definitely may work. Uh, stashing away your color chips, you know, purple, orange, black, uh, even black, but yeah, that, I mean, just hiding those and keeping those out of sight, coloring up uh, frequently would help. Um, Richard, I think you talked about that before. Yeah, I, I would say the the danger of that idea is you don't know if that's the shoe they're watching. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah, right. it's a kind of a risky thing because I mean, I mean, do you do much? Um, monitoring of people in real time or is it usually a review of play after the fact it could be both um a lot of our initiated you know we may get called by the pit saying hey can you check this player out um we may you know do it on our own and we go off of you know of course i guess you know most of the time it's a high low count just for to be generic but um yeah, I mean, we can we have the ability to go back and review, but most of the time, I think a rundown will be live. And so, yeah, you're you're playing a you know a, a cat and mouse game, I guess. If you're moving to another table, you're really hurting yourself more than anything. So, on the high low count, are the workers in your casino all fluent in that? Do you use software to analyze the play, or how good can you judge whether the, there is a card counter there or not? We like our people to be fluent. Yes, um, it's one of the things that we train on. You know, I, I basically train them how to be an advantage player, especially when it comes to blackjack, because how are you supposed to be able to identify one if you can't do it yourself? So you always want to have them be ready to jump in and count somebody down anytime. Um, there are software programs out there, but sometimes they are uh, very time consuming to uh, to put somebody you know, onto that program and to just have them go sit there for an hour or two to run somebody through it could take time. You might want to do that in some dead time. But, yeah, most of our evaluation is done live by people that do know how to evaluate a player. Do you actually use the software at all in your particular, where you're working? I do. Uh, we have been at several different properties, and uh, I think each one, yeah, each one has had it. Um, it's, it, like I said, it's very time-consuming. Um, it, it's not, I don't, find it to be um, extremely beneficial for, for evaluating a player as far as advantage play goes because we get what we need right there on the video. I, I don't know if you've read um, Burning the Tables of Las Vegas by Ian Anderson, but he has all these sort of cover plays that he recommends. Um, and I'm wondering if you, uh, if, if you think that that might fool you guys, that, um, you know, you have a player who – Maybe he uh, always um, stands on 16 versus a 10, um, even if the counts are negative. Or um, occasionally he doesn't 
uh, hit soft 18 against uh, a, a 10. Um, is that going to be enough to fool anybody or or no? As far as uh, the individual or as far as the program goes? Uh, as far as individuals who are counting people down. Uh, yeah, it could. Um, I mean, your bet fluctuation is going to be probably the biggest um, the biggest tool in your bag. You know, if it's if it's plus 10 and you drop down to a quarter, you know, true count plus four or something like that, you drop down to 50 or 100 when you were at five, that may send the flag up like, oh, maybe they don't know what they're doing. Um, but again, you know, it's all up to your on your side. How much are you willing to give up in one, you know, in one cover play, in one camouflage? And and would like who who would make the decision? For example, let's say you counted a guy down like that, and then I assume you have to call somebody, a shift manager or whatever, and then you say, well, I counted the guy down. His bets are moving mostly with the count, but he makes some bad plays. Uh, then do you make the decision we should get rid of the guy, or, does, or is that up to the shift boss, or how does that work? So that's all on table games. We, we give our, our evaluation of the player as best we can. So if there's, a, if there's a deciding factor, if the needle is you know, dead center, so to say, and we don't know, maybe, maybe they're not counting, maybe they are. It's hard to, sometimes it's hard, it is hard to tell, especially if it's done very well. But the, 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 the needle, the deciding factor could be like you said, the deviations, you know, did they make the correct deviation here and there? And if you, if you try to disguise that well enough, it may push the needle to no. Um, but, you know, you may be reevaluated on another visit. Um, but, yeah, that's all in the hands of table games. We give our recommendation and we pass it off to them. And uh, we have given the response before where it was just, you know, hey, we're not sure. Uh, it looks like they may be. We ran down three or four shoes and we can't tell. You know, it, sometimes it is that close. Most of the time it's cut and dry. But there are those gray area uh, situations. But uh, table games always usually makes the decision on whether to keep the player or not. Do you ever have situations where you say, no, this guy is a losing player and they throw him out anyway? I've never come across that one, no. Yeah. That would be and, a losing. And, Go ahead. I, um, I, I was going to ask about, um, do, do you guys, have you had any, experience with the facial recognition software and and how do you think uh that that performs so i've never had one on one of my properties but i have tested them and i have seen them in a test environment um i have it's funny you, you always hear negative things from surveillance people in the past because sometimes you expect what you see uh, on television which is you know hey here's a picture and click it and you know you want an answer like right away, but sometimes that doesn't happen, and sometimes they generate a lot of different results. Um, some of the technology out there is really good. Um, I just don't know how effective they would be in a casino environment because I personally have never seen them. I've seen them demoed in airport situations or in uh, banks or you know that kind of environment where sometimes the lighting's really great and sometimes the cameras are really great, and you know you have that chance to snap somebody's picture when they're staying still, where you don't always have it in a casino. Uh, people are on the move a lot. You know, even at table games, they're not really still. So it's really hard to get a really good picture sometimes. I had lunch one day with Ted Whiting, who was and probably still is the corporate surveillance director of all MGM properties. And he was trying to get as much information he could about me from me, and I was trying to get as much information I could from him. It was a, a, a cat and dog lunch. But he, they were just about to open up the Washington National, I'm not sure the name of it, the one in D.C., mm -hmm. that just opened up not so long ago. He was really bragging on how good the facial recognition was there. He seemed to think, it was really good and could keep up almost with what Facebook does. That is, um, so, and, you know, they had the money to spend on it, and they went for what they thought was the best. And uh, he was um, he was bragging on it. So I'm guessing it's out there. How affordable it is, how many places are going to install it is a different subject. But if they are willing to spend the money, the tools are there. Definitely. That's yeah, a big and they part can, of it. Sorry, Richard, go ahead. Yeah. 
and they continue to get better and better every year. And so, um, you know, in the past, uh, as you said, every surveillance person I talked to just sort of, you know, would shake their head and say it's worthless. But, you know, that was years ago and things are changing and they're going to continue to change. And eventually I think it'll be a real, you know, a real threat. Yeah, I agree. Uh, you know, every time it, you get a new piece of technology, it's obsolete in six months to a year, there's something better. And this is the same way. It just keeps evolving and getting better and better and better. Um, I don't doubt that they have something great. Richard, that was a really good point. It, it, I mean, uh, Bob, I'm sorry, it was a really good point. The money that you're willing to put out, it, it varies from place to place. And, you know, sometimes that's an expense that people don't want to take on. If that expense is not taken on, and, and on your end, you're never going to know it unless you know somebody comes out and says, "Yeah, we got great facial recognition." Um, but the the technology is definitely out there. And do you want to spend ten million dollars on a great system today, knowing that in three years it's going to be obsolete? So uh, those are interesting. Well, and and in uh, you know another another complaint that I used to get from uh, surveillance people is that because it's a department that doesn't generate revenue, they don't want to give us any money. So that, that's now when you're true. It's harder to, uh, it's harder to justify that when you're not frontline front, you know, front, uh, customer service aspect of it. Right. Okay. License plates. Do, is any place you work for actively gathered license plates, able to read them when they come into the parking lot and somehow send that information to somebody. So there's there's a, this is a multi-level answer. I, I'm going to have a few multi-level answers, but this is one of them. Um, okay. Yes, yes, we have. Well, we have the ability to uh, also. I mean, if, if we're following, well, I'll use you for an example, Bob. If we're following you out of the casino, you know, we may uh -huh. zoom in and, and get your plate, depending on what you did. Um, if you obviously, if you robbed somebody in the casino and we're following you out, we're getting it. Um, if, you know, to our, to By best of following our ability. me out, you mean following me electronically with camera? Correct. Yes. Sorry. Um, okay. So, yeah, as long as you're on camera coverage and somebody's watching you leave live, if you had done something illegal, then, yes, we're going to go for the license plate shot as best as we can get it. Um, for an advantage player, not all the time because it's not something that we really, at least in my, my experience, it's not really something that we sweat that much. You know, if you're coming back, you're coming back. It doesn't matter what you're driving. Um, it's not really that big of a deal. You didn't do anything wrong. And that's one of the things that we try to we try to stress to our people as much as we possibly can is the difference between advantage play and cheating because there are still places that I see that blur that line, and you can't. I, you know, I, I hear it on your show all the time, the people that come on and say that, you know, they were, they were making a move somewhere, they were making a play, and then they got locked up, chained to a bench, and, you know, and wrongfully arrested. It, it, that's the one thing that we try to prevent and, and – a lot of times, I, you know, my crew personally, we don't take that route with advantage play because we want to differentiate. You don't, we, we don't want to bring this to the police and say, can you run this plate for me? You know, it's a card counter uh, because we don't want to give them the wrong idea, number one. And number two, it's not really worth their time, and it may not be something that they do. And Yeah, it's different. Go ahead, Bob. Sometimes the distinction between advantage play and cheating gets pretty great. Um, we spoke, there's uh, a number of players who are always on the right side of the law. And there's a number of, we'll call them crossroaders, who frequently stray to the wrong side of the law. And there are people who mix the skills. So they have AP skills, and they also will pass post. Or they also will do something else that is definitely over the line. So it isn't a situation where just because you're an advantage player means you never cheat um, or just because you're a cheater means you never make an advantage play. So there's going to be shades of gray in there for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I want to I get back to the original question. I think what our uh, listener was asking is, do you have the ability to scan plates of the cars as they enter the parking lot automatically and alert someone that, oh, this player is arriving? Um, 
And, and th- I mean, there could be legitimate uses for that. Like if, if somebody is a whale and one of your great players, it'd be great to know that he's pulling into your parking lot. Yeah, definitely. There's, and that's, you know, that's kind of a multi-level answer and, a, and that's a great point. So yes, the technology is there. Um, I, I've personally never had it in action here or anywhere I've been actually, but the, uh, yeah, you would want to know when your big players are there and it would also work for people who are barred, um, you know, different reasons or people that are self-barred. Um, just, just catching them before they walk in the door would even be something that would be beneficial. But the, the technology is definitely there. Um, I don't know. I guess you would need something of high quality also compatible with whatever program you're using inside the surveillance room uh, at the same time. So your, your, your quality would have to be pretty good, I would assume. Yeah. I, well, it, you know, here in Las Vegas where they're paying for parking now, it automatically scans your plate when you pull up to the gate to take your ticket. Um, and then, it, you know, it used to be that it would automatically let you out, you know, for free because it knew that you had a Nevada plate or um, uh, in the beginning it actually would scan your driver's license. You had to scan your driver's license and show a Nevada license to, uh, to get the parking. But um, uh, I wanted to ask about just sort of your day-to-day work. I, I'm wondering if things have changed in the surveillance room because I, I remember years ago, uh, Cellini was kind of complaining that, you know, every time a slot machine was open, surveillance had to be watching it. Every time a, chi- uh, a fill was going on at a table, they had to be watching that. And, it, and I used to wonder, how can you watch all this stuff at the same time? I mean, do you still have to watch all of those things? And, and how do you have, have time to look for anything else? So you definitely have to prioritize your time. Um, yes, we do still have to watch things that, uh, I know, you know, if there are any surveillance people out there listening to this, they would actually probably agree with me that we don't want to watch at times. Um, but our internal controls tell people, call up, you know, surveillance will monitor and we monitor. And, um, we do, we do do a lot of things. Um, there are certain levels of fills. Every place is different. And that's, that's going to be my answer to a lot of different questions that we, that we talk about. Every place is different and every state is different. So there might be state guidelines that say you have to watch so-and-so here and or this process or this procedure or this count, and some states may not have it. Um, but, yeah, we, we will monitor a lot of different things. We handle um, everything from risk management issues to um, cheating to uh, advantage play to monitoring the drops, monitoring – and there could be several drops at the same time um, – you know, everything in between, uh, and that's not even counting the employees that you have to watch just regarding theft. So you do have to prioritize your time and, and make it valuable. And, it, you know, between calls, it's monitor what you can, watch what you can. Um, but as long as you can make your time work for you, um, it's it's doable. And we're outnumbered just, just coming to work. We're outnumbered, you know, it could be 500 to 1, depending on how many people are actually in the building. And how many people you have on in your surveillance room, uh, which you know helps when you can rewind. But you're outnumbered just coming to work, and that that's a challenge in itself. Uh, just keeping tri- tabs on everybody and making sure everybody's doing the right thing. It's uh, it can get overwhelming on a Friday and Saturday afternoon into Friday and Saturday evening. You know that's the busiest days of the week in a lot of places. And you know these call everybody kind of calls not thinking of the big picture, but everybody calls to, you know, for their own, their own purpose, their own, their own reason. And sometimes that stuff has to get pushed off, uh, you know, to a, to a period where we're not that busy. So how, how much of your time would you say that you actually get to just look around at what you want to look at as opposed to the stuff that you have to look at? Uh, that's a good question. I uh, never really thought of that. Probably um, in, a, in an eight-hour shift, you probably get a good amount uh, of free time, it, depending on how quickly the, the individual, you know, whoever, the general the general surveillance agent, um, you know, however they, fast they can bang out a report or, um, or save, you know, we have to save coverage with a report that we write and things on, on things that need coverage saved. So I guess it's uh, in an, up to the individual, but we, I would think that depending on your internal policies and procedures, you know, how closely do you have to watch everything um, is number one. So, for instance, the table drop. The table drop gets watched pretty closely because there's a lot of money 
on the floor at one given time. So the person doing that is doing that, and they're not going to be doing anything else. Um, but that doesn't mean the other people in the room aren't free to kind of you know start their own investigations or just scan around the floor uh, looking for people that shouldn't be there, looking for things that don't look right. Um, and that's that's a lot of our – that's our big tell is something that doesn't look right. When you say table drop, is that you mean when they change the boxes in the tables? Correct. Yeah, something like that would be a priority, right? So you you know, if there's so much money out there at one time. They're clearing out the boxes from every table, putting in the, the empty boxes for the next day. That's a that's a big thing. So that's going to take up somebody's you know, that's going to be the duration of however long that takes. We have one or two people watching it, and then the other people in the room, if nothing else is going on, kind of float around and do their own thing. Luckily, that only happens once a day. So I, I definitely want to get back to this when something doesn't look right. Yes. What, um, can you give some examples of that? Like Absolutely, yeah. What? Um, so it's not, you're in Vegas, uh, dead summer, 95 degrees, and you see somebody walking around with a bubble coat on their arm. You know, why do they have a winter coat on? It's 90 degrees. Um, you might want to follow that person because usually the coat is going to be a distraction for theft of some kind. They're going to steal from another patron. They're going to steal from us. Um, Little things like that, you know, the 99% of the people that come into a casino, they come in to have a good time. They come in to play, to, to forget about their day-to-day -day life, and they blend in. And you look around and you see that, that 1%. You, we look for the 1%, the people that, you know, don't seem to be looking for a game to play. They seem to be looking for something else. Are they looking for things that may be laying on the floor? Are they looking for things that, you know, did somebody leave a coat on a chair or uh, is there money unattended somewhere? And we look for that one person that may be sticking out. You know what I mean? Like you guys have, APs have a good way of blending in, um, which is good. You need that. But there are some people out for malicious purposes that don't. They don't blend in very well. And that's the uh, the 1% that we're really looking for. Yeah. yeah I, uh, how? I didn't. How? Go ahead, Bob. Go ahead. I was just going to be, make a smart-ass comment that I, during the rodeo at South Point, I might have been the only one in there without a cowboy hat, so I stood out. But, uh, but I'm sorry I really went this way. Richard, what were you going to say? I'd like smart-ass comments, Bob. That's okay. <laughs> well, a a actually, I was going to ask specifically about hats. Um, you know, I see different people on the forums. Some people uh, are saying uh, hats are a big uh, tell for advantage players, and uh, others, uh, you know, are on the side of you should always wear a hat. I mean, does it, does a hat make any difference at all to you? No, I've seen just as many people with hats as without them. Um, it, 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 even if you have a hat on low, we can still get you know, we can grab your picture from a different angle. It doesn't make any difference if you're hiding your face. We'll probably get it. Um, it, and and you're not more suspicious of someone just because they're wearing a hat. No, absolutely not. I mean, I, you know, when I go to a casino and play, I wear a hat. It's it's not you know, it, it's nothing. Some people just like hats. There's it, it, the play tells us everything. Um, we may not pick up on your appearance. We may not you know pick up on on certain things that that an AP may do, but the play speaks for itself most of the time. Uh, like we talked about before, sometimes there's a good cover, but usually it's the play that we're looking at. Now, um, here in Vegas, um, here in Vegas, there's been a big move to throw out slot machine players. And I'm, I'm also hearing stories from other parts of the country now that uh, other places are barring slot players. Uh, is this something you guys look for? How do you handle this? Yeah, when you told me that, actually, it was the, uh, the first I've heard of it. Um, we don't normally pay attention to slots that hard because everything's electronic. Um, you know, the, the slot people take care of their end. Um, it, for instance, if Bob comes in and, you know, he's sitting there playing a video poker machine, we're not necessarily going to pick up on him right away. But the slot people may, just because of the play, the name, I don't know. You know, I don't know what they look for. But on our end, the we're not looking for slots that hard, in my experience, because the money can go out so much faster on a table game or in the cage or someplace, you know, where money can transfer hands quickly. A slot machine, everything is kind of already left, um, in my opinion, everything's left on a blueprint. Every time you hit the button, it generates a record. Every time your play happens, it generates a record. And that record can be, you know, traced back if, they, if people need to go back and look at it at the paperwork. On well, the paperwork end, but it's not something that we actively search out. Um, 
I'm not really sure uh, what the plays are. I'd be interested to know of why you know why they're taking a stance on banning people on slots. But uh, that's the first I heard of it was when you guys told me. Well, let me give you some ideas. All right. The there are some we'll call them must hit by slots. Or okay. must hit by slots would be some kind of jackpot is going to go off before it reaches five hundred dollars. Gotcha. And so and it continues to go up. Now if you find an abandoned machine like that and it's at four ninety, good luck at finding that. <laughs> um any player with a clue as to what's going on is going to sit down and play it until it hits. Sure. It's, it doesn't have to be a positive play, but it usually is. There are a number of slots. The old time, on they had piggy bankings uh, where you could see a number. Many slots have patterns where if they get six or more of something in a particular area, then it's going to be a positive play until something happens. And so there's a community of players who have this kind of information as to, yeah, this is what you look for on these, this is what you look for on those. I'm not going into great detail on purpose, but you're getting the good, <laughs> you're, you're understanding the general idea of what I'm talking about. Yes. Uh, sounds like your casino doesn't pay any attention to those machines. No, it, I mean, it's, other... it's, it's like I said, there's uh, you, you take priority. And uh, for us, it may, and maybe not, I won't say the casino, but maybe the surveillance department um, where we won't, that won't be our first priority. Nor should it be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? And, I, you know, going back to your side of it, if, if you're that player, great. And, and that's just my personal opinion. If somebody's going to win it, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. if it's you 20 times and somebody else three times, that's their fault. <laughs> the, but on uh, video poker, uh, there are a number of casinos with progressives mm -hmm. where they start with a game that usually is not particularly high paying, but the one or more progressives keep rising until eventually – it's a positive play. Does surveillance keep track of the same guys who show up every time the meter is at a certain height? Honestly, no, not on my experience because, um, it's like I said, it, you know, you prioritize, and that's that's probably low on the priority list for for my group. Um, it, it's oh, that, that's a good answer. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> I knew you would like that one, but uh, no, I'm not trying to uh, diss video poker players at all. But you know, the, the, everything is in so much uh, flux that that would be low on our radar. Does not using a player's card ring any flags to you guys, one way or the other? Uh, no, not really. I mean, we've seen. I've seen. Uh, I'll go back to card counting. I've I've seen card counters get raided. I've seen people who were whole carding get raided, um, and just have no fear of of losing the play because sometimes the casino doesn't even pay attention to it on the floor. It's, uh, honestly, I've, I've come across a lot of times where uh, somebody's blatantly hole carding, just like all the way down on the chair, and nobody is really even better than I had it, and the person was getting raided the entire time. And it's something that, you know, just scanning around the pit would tell you, oh, hey, you got a person hole carding over there, just tell the dealer to straighten up, you know, straighten up their hole card. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean... Um, Refusals or refusals, it may even draw more attention being a refusal. I'm not sure uh, how people feel about that, but, uh, you know, sometimes people get complacent, and it's like, oh, you know, here's here's Bob Dancer. Uh, he's on Blackjack 810, and you, you know, oh, that's just Bob. He's here all the time. Um, do you you uh, do you use um, OSN, uh, Finn, Griffin, any of those, and who who's in charge of looking up? the person that's being rated and seeing if their name is in one of the databases. That would be one of the surveillance people. Yeah, we would, uh, we've would. we used a few of them over the several properties I've been at. Um, it, it's always, it, you, you want to take everything um, on a case-by-case -case basis if you feel like it's something that you need to look up, you look it up. Um, sometimes, the, you know, you, you find your, your answer, sometimes you don't. I've seen a lot of people still that are, are card, you know, 
with a you know 25 to 400 spread and they're not in any database <laughs> they're just doing it you know getting out of there and, and not getting identified and they're still doing a pretty good job of it um, it still happens so it's really good but uh, yeah we, we will check it out we'll check out from time to time and see if we can um, locate some people uh, and just you know inform table games as best we can you know hey you know Richard Munchkin's on this table over here and uh, you know he's a he's pole carding or whatever you know and um, we found that, you know, just scanning around the pits, like, oh, hey, that guy might look familiar from a flyer or something that we saw, and then we verify it. So, yeah, we do use uh, several different programs to try to uh, keep up with everybody. So you would, um, you would be able to you, – you scanned around, you saw me, you thought something looked a little off. You're able then to say, is that player being rated, and find out the name and details up sure. where you are and then look it up. If then if you're getting rated, we can do that. And then um, if you're not, I mean, even if you're not rated, we can still probably just look until we find it. Um, so if, I mean, if you feel like you've been doing this for you know 15, 20 years, and your picture's probably out there, your picture probably is out there. Um, maybe there's not a name attached to it. Uh, you know, some people do a great job of of not getting identified. Uh, their picture may be out there a hundred times, but nobody knows their name. But that's uh, it's all part of the game, I guess, which is awesome for us because it always gives us something to do. <laughs> yeah, I have a co-host who might fit into that category. The, um, how how you from the from your point of view, how user friendly are these databases? So, assuming this player, you didn't know their name, uh, you knew he's wearing a brown jacket and a Chicago Cubs hat. Uh, how long would it? take you I mean you can't be sorting by brown jackets you can't be sorted by baseball hats well they, he could sort by extremely good-looking <laughs> ah. oh I didn't know we were still talking about my co-host but okay <laughs> I thought he was giving you a compliment Bob <laughs> oh I uh, I'm um, pretty well limited to video poker <laughs> and since we are throwing compliments around this is a good time to, uh, to take a break for a commercial. The South Point has more than 10,000 gains, returning more than 99%. This is more than anyone else has. In December, the South Point is running its usual half price for almost everything, where you use your points starting as soon as the NFR rodeo is over until Christmas Eve. This year, it's between December 16th through December 24th. If you pay for your points, virtually everything is half price, including uh, movie tickets. You can buy movie tickets for next year, half price now. New Year's Eve packages, rooms, meals, etc. Also, Christmas Day, there will be double points for video poker players. Penny slot players get 10 times points, and other slots get 5 times points. Keep in mind that the base point structure is 0.30%, so double points at the South Point is equivalent to 6 times points at most other casinos. Every Monday is Seniors Day. Half price meals and bingo if you use your points. And there's um, okay, the new semester of free video poker classes is beginning Tuesday, January 8th, uh, starting at noon. If you're planning on being in Vegas early next year and are interested, check out the schedule on bobdancer.com. At videopoker.com, it's the best place to play lots of games. If you sign up for the gold membership, $8.95 a month or $79.95 a year, this allows you to get correction on most of the games. Through the end of this calendar year, listeners to our show who have not been a gold member at videopoker.com previously will get 30 days of gold. Uh, the address is videopoker.com slash GWAE. The game of the week is the new version of Dream Card. In many respects, it plays the same as the old version. It takes 10 coins, and periodically you get a Dream Card, which becomes the best possible card. The difference is, now you get the Dream Card less frequently, but when you do it, it is typically on a much better hand. They sort hands in the background, and when you get it, when they know you're going to get a dream card, they'll sort hands in the background and pick the best of three or four and give you that one. So 
the ending result is approximately the same in terms of expected value. If you look on the help screen, it will tell you how much the expected value is for that particular game. The strategy required for Dream Card is identical to the base game. So if you know how to play 9-6 double-double bonus, for example, you know how to play 9-6 double-double bonus Dream Card. All right, we are back with Griff, who is a surveillance guy from somewhere other than Las Vegas. And my first question has to do with jewelry, which could include rings or watches, etc. Uh, Kenny Houston, uh, the late Kenny Houston, once wrote that he was picked off because he wore the same ring time after time after time. And the surveillance guys noticed that the guy with this particular ring, they didn't know his name, did these things. Do you guys pay any attention to that? Do you have a database of jewelry? Uh, that's pretty good. I've never seen a database of jewelry, but uh, yeah, I mean, I have seen the same person. I'm giving you good ideas. I'm it, not it is. That's great. intentionally doing this. <laughs> that's great. Uh, but I have seen the same people, you know, sometimes the uh, repeat uh, – I don't want to say repeat offenders. That's not the right word. The repeat uh, APs will come in at, almost in a uniform and wear the same exact thing every time you see them. And it's just like, oh, there they are again. And it's you know almost not even uh, not even that hard at that point. Yeah, I mean you definitely want to change it up. Um, jewelry's a good one. That's uh that's pretty funny. Yeah, we I, I, we have a hard and fast rule. If you ever get backed off, the hat goes in the trash. <laughs> Never to be worn again. <laughs> <laughs> what about your wedding ring or your watch or something like that, Richard? If it's if it's a generic band, fine. But if it's your um, fifty thousand dollar Rolex, it's pretty flashy. Do you put that in the trash too? I wouldn't put it in the trash, but I probably would not wear it at least not for years. You know, um, certainly not in the casino where I got backed off. Now, I, I remember you, Richard, telling a story about a, a – was it a wig that you had or a beard? Um, th well, no, I, ha I had a friend who was wearing a wig and a fake beard. And uh, a boss went walking by, did a 180, looked at him and said, is that a fake beard? And he said, uh, uh, yeah, you know. And the guy said, I thought so, and just turned around <laughs> and walked away. Um <laughs> So uh, now Cellini used to say that that you could spot wigs based on no that was back when the cameras were worse I guess there was something about them that he said sort of lit up on camera that let you know it was a synthetic wig. Is that well, I never I never case? heard that no no I mean usually we just look for the uh, sometimes you know you, you see a bad toupee or something like that but uh, nothing that would uh, nothing that would actually stand out on on camera and I've seen some weird. Uh, some weird ones. I've seen the Rasta look. I've seen the, uh, the, 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 you know, you can definitely, you should just put a sign on it that says, this is a wig, wig. <laughs> and it's, <Yeah. laughs> I've seen some strange ones, but yeah, nothing, uh, nothing electronically like that that I've seen. You know, yeah, uh, do see... you look at, do you look at whether people are drinking alcohol or, I mean, does that have any effect? Um, or as you say, the play is going to determine. Uh, the play always determines it for me. I, when I'm looking at somebody, you know, they could have a beer in front of them. They could have three beers in front of them. I don't know what's in them, but uh, it, that's, never, uh, that's never a factor. I mean, if the person's – if you can see that the person is slosh drunk, you know, that might be, <laughs> that might be a factor. But if they're just, you know, casually drinking beers, uh, it's not really a big deal. A cocktail waitress in, several years ago on this show said at her casino – they had a code with the straws, such as you got an extra, I don't remember what the code was, but you got an extra straw in a drink if it was non-alcoholic or maybe a red straw or something so that surveillance could tell if it was um, alcoholic or not. Um, so assuming players hadn't figured out the code, you guys apparently don't do anything like that. Uh, no, but I can see where that would uh, would definitely help. And I know some places differentiate. Um, I've seen places do uh, clear glass versus frosted glass or something like that, or, uh, you know, lime or no lime or something. But that was mainly for the food and beverage purpose, not for us. 
So let's say you're um, surveilling and you come across a player who you that you know that you believe is an AP, but you did not kick him out or did not do anything with it on this particular trip. He got out of there before you took any action. How long do you keep his picture? Do you ever go and review? Are they posted on your bulletin boards that if this guy comes in again, uh, blah, blah, blah? Uh, how does that work? Sure. I mean, I I have no problem, you know, just letting someone walk out the door, number one, um, especially if it's an AP. You know, if you're on your way out, you're on your way out. Great. You know, you got me today. All right. Good for you. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we will definitely, you know, keep your picture up, maybe to evaluate you next time you come in. Or, um, you know, hey, if you spot this person again, you know, they beat us for you know, 10000 today or something like that. Check out their play the next time they're here. Um, and sometimes it's nothing. You know, it, yeah, I'll use you for an, an example again, Bob. You come in and play blackjack one day and smoke us for 20000 and we really didn't get a lot of play out of your – maybe it was just a shoe and a half, and we really didn't get a lot out of your, your evaluation. We might put you up, you know, hey, next time this guy's in, let's check him out. Let's see if he's counting or not. And sometimes the answer is no. Oh, was I wearing an afro when I won that 20 You were. Yeah, it was the Rasta wig, yes. <laughs> uh, good, okay. Uh, now, some, so, uh, what about if somebody beats you for – Forty or fifty thousand, and you know that they're not counting. Um, now there are some casinos that are just going to back the player off anyway, right? Because mm-hmm. they they just rather would not ha- take that kind of risk, right? Um, even though the guy might be a really good player for the casino, um, how how do they feel about that? I mean. As far as table games, I mean, it's hard yeah. to uh, – every every joint is different. And the reason why I say that, some people like the action, some people sweat the action. And the, the people that sweat the action, when somebody beats you for 50000 you know, they may call us 10 different times. Are you sure? Are you sure? they got to be doing something. Are you sure? But they're winning. I know, people win. It's okay. <laughs> you know, it's not – there's not always something going on. It's legit play, and they beat us. And then the next time they come in, they beat you for another 40, and it's like – then you get 20 calls. Okay, uh, what do we do? Let them keep playing. It's called house edge. It'll come back. Uh, you know, over time. Sounds like you work in an enlightened casino. <laughs> uh, no, I, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> That's my answer. <laughs> so it's, uh, sometimes you don't get people that see uh, your point of view either. Um, a lot of people, and, and then the first time they come back and lose 150, it, it's, it's, there's no call. There's no call saying, oh, He's down 150, or oh hey, you were right. <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, it's hard to um, to make a point sometimes, especially when um, money leaves. You know, some people that I've dealt with over the years have definitely got it on the table game end, uh, and some people just don't. And there rarely is an in between. And uh, you know, I've heard you say that uh, you know casino people are mindless, and I uh, I won't fully agree with that, but I've gotten that over the years. Um, there's some people that you just can't talk to. It's just no, it's never going to work. I will admit that there are some sharp people who are working in casinos who do get it, as yes. you say, who do yeah. get it, and and they know that some, you know, if no player ever won, then nobody would gamble. So right, yeah. exactly. But but sometimes they just do things that are mindless, like bar slot players. Yeah, I don't I don't get it, and and sometimes it's um. You, I, I, it's always called the business decision, but sometimes the business decision doesn't make any sense. Okay. Um, Griff, are you now or have you been in a position where you hire and fire surveillance operators? Yes. Okay. What kind of person are you looking for? What would make the ideal surveillance operator in your point of view? What would make you think, this guy isn't going to work? That's a great question. Um, Normally when I'm interviewing, I look for uh, math skills, number one. Um, You know, it's a a complicated job when you're talking odds, you know, payouts, dollar amounts, camera numbers, everything has a time attached to it, you know, report numbers. I I look for people that are numbers oriented. That helps. Um, It helps a lot, especially when people can do math quickly. Um, Because, you know, we can hit pause, but not all the time. You know, there's sometimes where we have to generate numbers pretty quick. Um, I look for people that are going to be um, a good fit. You know, surveillance people, we're not that front of house person that 
has the greatest customer service in the world because we don't deal with people. Uh, we see it, it's hard because we see the uh, the worst side in people sometimes. We you know we see the thieves and we see the uh, the fights and the drunks and you know all of that. Um, and it's something that we get used to, so we kind of actually have to uh, to keep that in mind. You know, it, sometimes people are a great fit. Sometimes people have seen it before at other places. Sometimes the past job may may help, but um, it's definitely uh, not the it's not the Disneyland. You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah, that surprises me. That that is not what I would have expected. That um, you know that that math skills would be important, but that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, if, even if you take AP out of it, um, just watching a game. Use roulette, for example. You know, you have to you be able to do 35 times one. You have to be able to do 17, eight combination bets. There's an eight, 11, and a, and a 17. What's it add up to? And you, sometimes you have to do it quick, and some people, you know, can't grasp it. And I'm not looking for rocket science. You know, sometimes it's just basic math, add, subtract, multiply, divide percentages, and, and that'll get you through your, your time. Thanks. In Vegas, a lot of jobs are especially in the past, of who do you know? If, um, if somebody who currently works there says this is a good guy, that would be a step up in the interviewing process. Does that work very much in the surveillance departments? Absolutely. Yeah, just like anywhere else. I mean, um, you, never, you always want to help people uh, succeed, and then if, you know, if they want to go elsewhere, you give them all the tools, and, and especially if they're good. I don't want to recommend someone who's not that great to somebody else, you know. But um, to the people that are really good, yeah, I, you know, you always want to uh, give a good recommendation and help them. And I've gotten the recommendation from people, you know, this guy's interested. You might want to take a look, and, you know, I interview them, and they're great. But it definitely yeah, goes a long way. Actually, have you also gotten – Yeah, have question you also gotten – this is my idiot nephew uh, – Give him a job. <laughs> I've gotten the. Uh, I've never been pressured into it, but it's always like, uh, hey, you might. We might get one of those. Uh, hey, can you interview this guy? Um, you'll see for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> what percentage of the problems you discover, and assuming for now the problem is defined as. Uh, threatening the bottom line of the casino. For now, that's the problem. What percentage of that problem are APs of various sorts, cheaters, employees? That's another good question. You guys are loaded with good questions. Um, the employee theft is going to do the most damage. Um, there's a lot of times, you know, the, the, the place is so big and it could go unnoticed for a while. Employee theft always adds up much faster than any uh, than any AP. Um, I don't think because, and I don't want to I don't want to put anybody down, but APs are smarter than most people, <laughs> so you know when to stop. You know when to get out. You know I've been playing for four hours. I don't have any heat. Maybe I'll go back later, or it, maybe I'll you know hit them tomorrow or something like that. Where the this, the thief can't stop. They can't stop stealing, and they're going to get caught eventually. Um, it, it's just the damage that somebody can do on the inside is, is much higher than the damage somebody can do externally. How, what, what do you think the percentage is of, um, well, how, how much cheating do you run into? And, and is most of it really amateur stuff? I mean, the stuff I read about in the newspapers is, you know, some idiot capped a $25 bet when he was drunk or whatever. Um, how much uh, actual sort of what I guess what we would call professional cheating do you, do you run into? Professional cheating, um, well, that's a good question. There's, there's two parts. Um, how often is it caught, and how often uh, do we have we seen have we seen it? I guess are two different questions. But the professional stuff is uh, is number one is done really well. I mean, when you see someone, you can definitely tell the difference between someone who knows what they're doing and they've made a career out of it against a $25 bet capper who's drunk. It's almost like uh, an, an art form when you see it pulled off. Um, for instance, a dice slide. You know, a dice slide's never just one guy. It's a team. And when you see it in action, it's, it's actually orchestrated, and the timing is perfect. And if, if the timing's not perfect, it's going to get caught. But the timing of it is, and, and the act itself, you know, it's a hit and run, but at the same time, they hit you for, you know, a good amount of money. Um, but that kind of stuff is um, 
it happens, but it doesn't happen a lot. I don't know if it's just it, it, places like Atlantic City and Vegas, they could be a little different because you can blast up and down the boardwalk or you can blast up and down the strip and you can hit, you know, seven or eight different joints maybe in one one or two days and do the move over and over and over again until it doesn't work anymore or until you made enough money. But uh, it, it doesn't, it, it happens kind of infrequently. Uh, at least it's caught in, uh, infrequently sometimes by us. Uh, it's more sporadic than anything. How often do you end up with the, the, the drunk capping the $25 bet or the other kind of stupid cheating, amateur cheating? The amateur, yeah, the amateur stuff happens much more. It's, uh, you know, most of the time, to be honest with you, it's uh, taking advantage of a dealer who's not paying attention or a dealer that's weak. They'll be the, uh, the prime target. And then, you know, it's just game on from there. But that happens uh, much more than the, than the elaborate stuff. Uh, probably less – there's probably more advantage play than, uh, than cheating on a, on a daily basis, I would say, on average, at least, you know, from what I've seen. It's not uh, – and I know every place is different. There might be places where your, your procedures are everything. Richard, you dealt, so you know. Uh, it's, it, your procedures are everything. If, as, as everybody, you know, if everybody's following the right procedure, they're much, more, uh, much less susceptible to getting burned. And the better procedure that there is on the floor, the easier it is for us up here, and everything kind of flows um, well. But when it's not like that, you, you really leave yourself open to a lot of outside cheating, a lot of outside uh, like uh, uh, theft. And is advantage play something you see on a daily basis or a no. weekly basis? Yeah, I would say, uh, let me see if I can put an average to it, maybe uh, one or two a week. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, as, uh, especially card counters in the beginning have this feeling like all surveillance does is look for me, you know, <laughs> like that's, that's all their focus. And, and just, you know, taking this show as an example, so much of what you talk about has nothing to do with advantage player card counters. It's, you know, all the other stuff that you guys have to be doing up there. Right. Yeah. I mean, your, your first line of uh, defense should be against uh, table game personnel, table game personnel, and, and they're the ones that you're interacting with, you know, 100% of the time. Um, if you can fool them, more than likely you'll be, you know, you'll be on the table for a while. It's, uh, it, it, we, we come across, we do, you know, we do find some, some APs, but it's, uh, the, your, your game down there has to be strong. And it's, uh, you know, some people can talk too. Uh, the, the, the more you can talk it up and, and blend in, you know, the less you are to, uh, to getting heat. So the real threat is the phone call to surveillance more so than surveillance just looking around and picking you off. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're, you're talking to the, everybody on the floor. You're talking to them. I mean, they can pick up on certain things, too. Are you trying to hide yourself at the table? Or are you, you know, sometimes uh, engaging in conversation goes a long way. Um, you know, sometimes engaging the dealer goes a long way. A toke might go a long way. You know, it, it, you've been in, uh, you've been in that situation before on both ends. You dealt and you're, you're an AP. It's it, sometimes that that quarter toke just might shut somebody up for a half hour, 45 minutes. You know what I mean? It's it's it, that little thing can go a long way, especially if you're nice to them. A lot of dealers deal with a lot of crap all the time, and uh, you know, the first yeah. sign of something, they might call up. <laughs> all right, we've been talking to Griff who's a surveillance guy, and we're less than halfway through our questions, and our time is up. So, Griff, can we talk you into coming back for next week's show as well? Absolutely. That's the right answer. Okay. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Griff. Uh, thank you, Richard. And go out and hit lots of royal flushes, everybody. Good day. <laughs>